Uh, my name is Mo Zhe, uh, and I'm currently a postdoc at University of Chicago. And I did my postdoc, uh, I did my PhD study with uh, Professor Raphael Bushweiler at Ohio State. That's where the works that we'll be discussing in this presentation mostly done at. Um, so during my PhD research, we developed uh, we basically kind of worked at the interface of nanoscience and and um, and a more spectroscopy to develop this nanoparticle assisted and a more relaxation experiments. And um, so just a, a quick refresher for everyone. Um, there are generally two types of spin relaxation. The T1 relaxation, also known as longitudinal relaxation or spin lattice relaxation, uh, is basically you look at the Z components or the longitudinal components. Why uh, I got a some notices. Got a, sorry, I was a little bit distracted. So um, T1 looks at the building up of the magnetization along Z axis when the magnets spin, uh, when the magnetization re uh, returns to the um, uh, equilibrium states, whereas T2 or also known as the transverse relaxation or spin-spin relaxation looks at the decay of the magnetization in the transverse plane or the xy plane. Therefore, if you have two spins, one returns back, recovers faster, the other returns back to equilibrium state slower, you will see different behaviors of their relaxation behaviors. And, um, we uh, more often we use R1 and R2 uh, to describe the relaxation rate, which are the inverse of T1 or T2. So I'm sure uh, we're all very familiar with this type of behavior. Let me uh, find my laser pointer. So this type of behavior, uh, T2 is actually um, goes monomerically with the tau C, which is the correlation, uh, tumbling correlation time of the molecule. Uh, basically, it tells us if you have a small molecule that tumbles fast, you have very similar T1 and T2, or R1 and R2. For large molecules, for example, proteins and other macro biomolecules, um, they actually, you kind of see the split in the T1 and T2. So T2 for larger molecules is smaller. Or in other words, the relaxation rate of T2, which is R2, goes mono monotonically uh, with the size of the molecule. From a spectroscopy perspective, if you look at the line width, which is a really good reflection of the T2, um, you kind of uh, um, see the uh, line width got broadened for a large size molecule. So the most important information of this slide is that the R2 relaxation is very sensitive to molecule size. The larger the molecule is, or the more rigid, uh, slow tumbling uh, species will have larger R2. And from a spectroscopy perspective, you will see broader lines. A little bit of theory behind it. Um, so this behavior, or I also plotted in the uh, R1 and R2 rates, basically take the inverse of these two curves. Um, 
we will see the different behavior of T1 and T2. The reason for this is because for R2 relaxation rates, it is dominated by this J0 term, whereas in the R1, you don't see this term. So when J0 is dominating, you don't see this term. Basically, the J0 is almost uh, almost linear responded to tau C. Therefore, RC, uh, uh, R2 is basically a function of tau C uh, under certain circumstances. That's why we kind of see this uh, almost a linear response of R2 to tau C. Now we, in this particular study, we actually use a nanoparticle as a R2 enhancer, kind of similar to the idea of uh, EPR type of experiment. We have the um, um, we have a uh, paramag paramagnetic species that uses as a R2 enhancer. Uh, it it basically enhances the R2 relaxation and based on this, you can get some distance information, for example, or you can find added the dynamics of a protein, et cetera. And from this type of information uh, allows us to study the systems better. Okay. Uh, all right, now I can start my video. Thank you, Asif. Um, so in this slide, for example, uh, we could think of a system that has, say, a certain type of uh, nuclear spins. And these nuclear spins can either be in their free states in the box solution, or sometimes they can absorb, they are absorbed to the surface of a nanoparticle. Uh, which is uh, bigger in size, tumbles much slower. If the uh, nuclear spin exchanges between these two states, and if this exchange rate is in the fast exchanging regime for NMR spectroscopy, which is typically uh, in, let's say, tens of uh, microseconds or faster, then the uh, NMR spectrum of this species is just the uh, average behavior of these two states. Now, if you look at the R2 relaxation rates of this species, it is actually a averaged R2 behavior uh, between these two states, and it is a population weighted. Now, if you rearrange this equation a little bit and solve for PB, which is a population of the bound state, we got this equation. So um, so, so, so in the denominator, you just have this R2B minus R2F and R2B, which is the bound, oh, which is a R2 relaxation of this uh, nanoparticle that is moving very slowly, very bulky. This is a, a large number. For example, uh, for nitrogen 15 spins for 20, nano, uh, 20 nanometer diameter nanoparticles, the R2B is estimated to be uh, a 1,600 second inverse. Um, and up here, uh, you just uh, take the difference between the effective R2 minus R2F. Uh, we denote it as delta R2. So by the end of the day, the population can be solved by using delta R2 divided by the uh, R2 rate of the, uh, of the nanoparticles, which is a big number and it is constant. This tells us if you have a sample of interest, you measure their uh, R2 relaxation rate as you would do normally. And then if 
you also have a second sample or you titrate it in nanoparticles, you measure the effective R2 rates again, and you take the difference for each particular spin and divide it by R2. This can give us the population information. Well, all of this assumes that it happens at a fast time, uh, fast exchange time scale. We can discuss more about the exchange time scales uh, if we have time. But here, throughout the, the this presentation, we are dealing with systems that are in fast exchange regime. So, uh, in this presentation, we also uh, we, we, we keep using the same type of uh, silica nanoparticles unless otherwise stated. So why silica nanoparticles? Silica nanoparticles are probably one of the most widely used nanoparticles. Um, they, they are applied to uh, extremely wide uh, areas of industry and our daily life. They are physically and chemically stable and uh, they are also considered to be biocompatible. There's no much nanotoxicity type of concern, and the surface is relatively easy to modify. So if we work with the pristine nanopart silica nanoparticles, you will find the two types of, of surface groups, um, one being silana groups, which is just hydroxyl groups on silica, uh, attached to silica, uh, silicon items. Um, and you also find this siliconine motifs that has a silicon, oxygen, silicon motif. So the first one under physiological conditions can partially depro uh, deprotonate it. Um, that leads to a overall negative surface charge for these nanoparticles. And the siliconine groups tend to be a little more hydro hydrophobic. So we did a little bit better characterization of this nanoparticles. They are, uh, they have a very narrow size distribution around the 20 nanometers in diameter. Um, and they are very stable over time. When you mix it with the sample, most of the cases, uh, it remains as this colloidal form for uh, many, many hours, if not uh, many, many days. So in the following sections, I would discuss a little bit about how to measure R2 uh, for this tutorial purposes. And then we will basically go through kind of a case study, uh, kind of showing you how we apply this nanoparticle assisted NMR to different systems and to get useful information for each system, including metabolites and nucleosides. There are small molecules. We also studied intrinsically disordered proteins, or just a kind of a um, very flexible peptides, as well as globular proteins before we draw the conclusion. So now let me just uh, briefly introduce how we measure our tool. Um, this is a, a, a little bit uh, technical detail, um, don't get it distracted. What we try to focus is really here, there are generally two ways to measure R2. Uh, one is called R1 row or the R1 in the rotating frame. Um, you, the key is here, you apply a spin lock um, pulse that basically um, kind of keep uh, basically it spin locks the magnetization uh, in this rotating frame and then you basically just look at how fast the magnetization shrinks over time uh, depending on whether the resonance whether the um, nuclear spin is on resonance or off resonance you kind of have slightly different behavior and you have to during the processing, uh, data processing stage, you have to correct for that. A second popular way of marrying R2 is CPMG. It's basically a, uh, a bunch of uh, pulse trains 
um, you apply that uh, 180 degree pulse again and again, and you change the spacing in between, that allows us to apply different relaxation delays. Uh, both method works pretty fine for uh, protein, for example, backbone nitrogen 15 spins. Um, because by the end of the day, what you're really measuring is the intensity as a function of time for each peak. You apply the uh, relaxation delay. In this case, you change the length of the spin lock. And in this case, you apply multiple, um, you, you change the number of uh, pipe pulses you applied and also the, the gaps in between. Um, those are you know, the, the parameters you can fine tune and you measure the intensity over time. You fit it to a uh, mono exponential decaying curve. And from this equation, you can extract the R2 relaxation time, which can be uh, very, very accurately measured. Um, here is a very good starting point, uh, a review paper by professors Palmer, Krenker, and Loria. Uh, I think this is a very good start, starting point to kind of get yourself familiar with R1 and CPMG if you haven't. Uh, and there are many other excellent reviews and learning resources out there. For small molecules, however, uh, typically we measure carbon-13 spins on natural abundance carbon-13, uh, which is about 1.1%. Um, for, for small molecules, it is generally recommended to use CPMG pulses because in this case, um, you apply those pi pulses and you wait in between rather than for a spin um, for R1 in R1 row experiment, you kind of have to apply the spin lock pulse for a certain time. But because small molecules tumbles really fast, they are in the almost in the um, uh, the extremely narrow extreme narrowing limit, which means. The, the coherence time is really long. You have to apply this spin lock pulse relatively long, and that sometimes can heat up the, the probe and the, the, the sample as well, uh, which is not ideal. Whereas if you use CPMG pulse, uh, you, kind of, you, you kind of just apply a bunch of uh, pulse trains and wait in between the, um, the delay in between the pulse will take care of the, the heat. It won't as easily heat it up as R1 row type of experiment would do. So now let's move on uh, case study. The first example we looked at is in the context of uh, metabolomics. So just a little bit background. Uh, we are probably more familiar with the genome or proteome, uh, but actually there is another big ohm that is known as a metabolome that is just uh, all the small molecules inside a living system or in a biological sample. These are the complete collection of the small molecules. They are typically the initial intermediate or the end products of a chemical reaction for example, during a enzymatic catalyzed process. And these molecules can be the building blocks or they can be just uh, some um, extrinsic molecules from outside of the world. And by studying the metabolome of a certain sample, we can get information about the, the uh, phenotypic type of that particular sample. For example, uh, it is very useful for the early diagnostics for uh, certain diseases. Uh, we can also learn about the uh, nutrition stuff uh, using, uh, by, uh, by doing metabolomic study. Um, so NMR spectroscopy is one of the uh, very powerful analytical techniques to do metabolomics. We have a 
for example, if we have a uh, mixed sample that contains about hundreds, if not thousands of small molecules, we can just simply take the NMR spectrum and try to resolve all the resonances and then identify what are the molecules here. The end goal of metabolomics study is to identify and quantify each metabolite components in that uh, in in this metabolomics mixture sample. However, NMR has its certain limitation. For example, it can be very congested. Uh, many molecules have very similar chemical shift. Um, for example, in this region, which is a, sh a sugar-rich region, the lines are just uh, very, very congested and it's almost impossible to resolve all these lines in the typical one-dimensional proton NMR spectrum. We can definitely spread it to multi-dimensional NMR spectrum. For example, here is the HSQC spectrum. You correlate the proton dimension versus a carbon dimension. And then in this case, it gives us much better separation of these spectral lines. Uh, however, even this, we still see some of the congested area. Um, that becomes later, can become a problem for uh, the accurate identification of uh, metabolites. So here, uh, our strategy is, what if we use nanoparticles? Because nanoparticles has, have certain surface properties they can selectively bind to a subcluster of metabolites, but not others. So only those who interact with nanoparticle surface will be influenced, will be impacted. So to do this, we kind of uh, did this test experiment. We prepared a 10 compound model mixture that contains positive charged molecules, negative charged molecules, and neutral molecules uh, at the same concentration. Now we add nanoparticles in. What we saw is some of the peaks disappeared. The reason behind it, again, is because they interact with nanoparticles. Uh, the tumbling rate becomes really, really slowed down. Um, they have very, very broad line width, broad enough that they are buried in the background and you don't see them as a sharp peak. So if you look at which ones are interacting with the silica nanoparticles, re remember these silica nanoparticles are negative charged in the surface, all the positive charged molecules are gone. And here, dimethylglycine is also uh, invisible and we will discuss that later. Similarly, we now use uh, cationic silicon nanoparticles, which are positively charged in surface. So when we use this type of nanoparticles, the negatively charged molecules are suppressed, which makes sense because you know the, the interaction is dominated by charge-to-charge -charge, uh, attractions or Coulomb force. Again, dimethylglycine is gone. So um, we, we then move on to a real metabolomic sample. This is a urine sample. Typically, you can find hundreds, if not thousands, of compounds inside uh, a, a human urine sample. Here is just a selected region of a HSQC spectrum. Without nanoparticles, this is the, still the pristine, the negative charge nanoparticles. Uh, we see a bunch of uh, spectral lines. And if we now add nanoparticles, many of these peaks disappeared. And if we try to identify which these peaks are, most of them belongs to the positively charged molecules. But there is another group of molecules that share one thing in common. That is, they all have this uh, methyl attached directly to a nitrogen, so we call it a, a N-methyl motive. So all of these molecules are also um, 
uh, suppressed by the addition of silicon nanoparticles. So that actually triggered our interest. We thought, why is that? So we did a little bit uh, more detailed study because up to now we're just doing qualitative study. Now with these four compounds, glycine, sarcosine, dimethylglycine, and trimethylglycine, uh, we can actually also measure the relaxation rate very accurately on, on the carbon-13 uh, atom, uh, on the carbon-13 carbon nucleus of this uh, methylene group. So what here you see is, so, so this is a, just a 1D proton spectrum. This is a, a real experiment, not a simulation. Um, you see the light color is the original spectrum. When you add nanoparticles, glycine doesn't really change much. However, sarcosine, dimethylglycine, and trimethylglycine, uh, the line width becomes wider and wider. This means you have a, a more and more population of the molecules that is interacting with the uh, silicon nanoparticles as you go from zero methyl to one to two to three methyl groups attached to the nitrogen. Um, and if you look at the carbon-13 relaxation rates, uh, this allows us to do a better quantification. It goes you know, from some small number to trimethylglycine, that is, uh, we've got a, a six second inverse um, in, in the R2 enhancement. So really, this really tells us the more methyl and methyl motif you have, the more likelihood the molecule will interact with the, the surface. It turned out to be the M methyl motif is actually very common in, in, in many of the systems, especially in the nucleosides. Um, in many of the modifications were known as uh, post uh, epigenetics or post translational or post uh, transcriptional modification. Utilize the methyl group um, to basically do cellular signaling. Interesting discovery or observation is that for the nucleosides that without any methylation, like just you know the native ones, arginine, uh, guanidine, cytosine, and uridine, um, the delta R2 does, is not changing that much. Basically, they don't interact with silica very strongly. However, with the methylation, they tend to in increase the binding affinity of these molecules to silica surfaces. And remember that from the delta R2, we can get population information directly. And also uh, recall that population, you know, from a thermal static, uh, thermal dynamics perspective, population also tells us the equilibrium and we can kind of get the equilibrium constant information from that. And from equilibrium constant, we can calculate the, the change in free energy. So we calculated that the, the change in free energy by having one n methyl motif is in the order of about the minus three kilojoule per mole. If you have two methyl groups, that almost help you to increase the binding energy uh, by, by two folds. So here a quick summary for, the, for, for this section. Uh, we use the silica nanoparticles to selectively or differentially bind to certain class of molecules in a metabolomic sample that help us to suppress their signal um, from the original spectrum, uh, which in turn allows us to accurately identify their identity. And we also noticed that the, the N-methyl motif is very likely to be 
silica phyllic, it has a natural tendency to bind to silicon nanoparticles or silica surface in general. Um, so, so the, it, uh, we we can apply this kind of um, silica or, or nanoparticle assisted NMR experiment to help us um, identify metabolites better in a metabolomic sample. And that can help us to do many, many other things in real world. Now for the sake of time, let's move on to the second uh, case study, which we applied nanoparticle assisted NMR spin relaxation on intrinsically disordered proteins. Intrinsically disordered proteins, just in case you don't know, uh, are a class of proteins that indeed widely exist in our body. It is estimated that more than 30% of uh, eukaryotic proteins contains either, are, are either intrinsically disordered or contains a large segment of disordered region. The IDPs actually perform very, very critical biological uh, functions inside our body, including molecular recognition, uh, molecular assembly, protein modification, as well as in some cases, they just a random, they, they just uh, serve as a entropic chain that kind of um, is a, a linker, a flexible linker that keeps things in place. They are very flexible in, in their structure uh, compared to a well-folded protein. Uh, the conformation of space is is just a gigantic, and also uh, importantly, the uh, dysregulation of IDPs can sometimes lead to severe disease. Therefore, there is an effort to try to target or drug I IDPs with silicon nano with the uh, synthetic nanoparticles because nanoparticles has a large surface area, it can interact uh, with the um, IDP molecules uh, with multivalent binding. Here I'm showing you a crystal structure of a DNA molecule surrounded by four structured region of P53, the human tumor suppressor protein. What is missing in this electron density plot is these regions. They are the first 72 residues of P53. They are very flexible, therefore um, you couldn't really crystallize them. Um, so we use this first 73 residues known as uh, the transactivation domain of P53 as a model system in this study. So we express the P53 TAD with nitrogen labeling and then purify the sample. We take an NMR spectrum. It looks something like this. So one of the characteristics of um, uh, IDP is that they have very narrow dispersion along the photon dimension. Uh, look here is just one ppm. So it's kind of very uh, congested in the proton dimension. Um, so these are the uh, HSQC spectrum, which we correlate the protons and the nitrogen atoms for each of the this proton nitrogen spin along the backbone. We can assign the resonances, and we can also add the nanoparticles to the sample shown as this uh, blue trace. So if you add high concentration of nanoparticles, the IDP, the P53 TAD interact very strongly and to the point that sometimes you just don't see any peaks. Therefore, for mirroring the relaxation in the presence of nanoparticles, uh, it is important to use the right amount or right concentration of silicon nanoparticles so that you see the peaks, but also the um, relaxation enhancement is strong enough 
so that you can mirror that effect uh, very easily. So what we can get from mirroring the relaxation rate of this protein, well, we could mirror the, you know, again, this is uh, the delta R2. So we measure the, a sample with the presence of nanoparticles and we subtract that from the free sample. So we take the delta R2, plot it along the residue number of this protein. So if you look at this curve, it's, it is kind of a wavy. There are certain regions that have very large delta R2 values, including the tail where we can actually find some of the arginine residues here. And this section, we, where we can also find some positive charged residues. Again, remember the nanoparticles is negatively charged. It, is a, it makes a sense that these regions have elevated the delta R2 because of the electrostatic interaction. But we think we can actually do better uh, then, because we know the sequence of this molecule, of this peptide, and we want to predict whether uh, using the sequence information, whether we can reproduce such a profile. So to do that, we first they studied a bunch of, uh, uh, of, uh, peptide constructs uh, using site-directed mutagenesis. For example, in this case, we mutate the proline 27 to a asparagine, which asparagine does not really interact with the nanoparticles uh, very strongly. So by comparing these two curves, the difference we denoted delta delta R2 has a profile that 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 is centered at the uh, the mutated side, but then this effect faded away as you're moving away from that mutated side. Similarly, here if we remove two of the asparagine um, residues, which are negatively charged, we actually see a negative effect in the delta R, delta R two. Um, profile, which means, you know, after we take away this negative charge residues, the region, because of the, um, because we lose the repulsion force, this region can, has a higher tendency to bind to the nanoparticle surface. And then here, uh, we mutate a lysine residue out, and we also see this type of similar behavior, but the range, the interaction range, is longer. So to model this, we say, let's just try a simple exponential decaying function uh, that is centered at the mut mutated side, and then the effect that goes away. For we use a lambda, which is this factor, it basically tells us how fast it decays away. We use a smaller one for a uh, neutral, uh, or, or uh, the neutral residues. And for the charged residues, we use a much longer uh, value or oh, much larger value to model this. And then this AJ tells us, uh, basically models how much effect it is. It's basically the height of the center of this exponential decaying curve. To do that, we measured the carbon relaxation rate for all the 20 amino acid, uh, all the 20 amino acid types in their free form. So if you look at the amino acid structure, they have everything in common, but this R group. So this differential effect really tells us that uh, um, depending on what R group they have, depending on what side chain they have, they can bind very differently with, they can, they can bind to silicon nanoparticles with very different affinities. For example, lysine, arginine, these are positive charge residues. They interact very strongly with negative charged silicon nanoparticles, proline residues as well. Some of this 
methyl containing and aromatic residues, they kind of, uh, uh, they are in the intermediate range. And for many of the, these negative charged or kind of uh, hydrophilic residues, they barely have any effect. So we kind of uh, fine tune this a little bit better, uh, do a better parameterization based on all sorts of the uh, data, including the mutagenesis, including multiple constructs. So we, we are able to reconstruct the uh, delta R2 profile based on uh, the very, very simple information from uh, amino acid types. For example, if you have a polypeptide chain, what you can do is for each of the residue site, you have this exponential decaying curve, right? All the parameters are known or already parameterized. And we, for each residue site, we just sum up all the effects, not only from itself, but also from neighboring residues. And we do that for all the residue sites. And that's how we predict the uh, delta R2 profile for the peptide based on the individual amino acid information. Now let's look at the, the real experiment the data. Again, I'm showing you this is a delta R2 profile plotted against residue number. And from this, we call it a free residue interaction model. We just sum up all this individual effects, and then we got this black curve, which actually uh, goes very close, follows this, this uh, experimental data. And this is not a single shot experiment. Uh, we tested it on different systems, including alpha synuclein, which is a very important uh, intrinsic disorder protein uh, that is quite concentrate in our brain, I think uh, probably about 1% of proteins in human brain is alpha synuclein. And um, for PUP, uh, prokaryotic ubiquitin-like protein, uh, and for cytosol 2 which is cytosolic 2, cytosolic loop 2 of uh, calcium, uh, of, uh, of sodium calcium exchanger protein. And we also implemented everything into a, a web server that you can just uh, type in the sequence of the IDP and then it tells you what is the expected delta R2 profile uh, when it interact with silicon nanoparticles. So this basically tells us um, the different region or different segments of a disorder protein can interact more or less independently with the nanoparticles. Some of these regions interact more strongly, then you see an elevated delta R2 profile. Others never interact and you just see no change in their delta R2 values. I was pretty happy up to now, but our uh, sign, uh, senior scientist in the lab, Dr. Da Wei Li, was uh, telling me actually we can do more than that. So his rationale is, look, if you compare your P53 TAD with alpha synuclein, um, there is a big difference, uh, overall scaling difference in terms of their, their binding affinities. And also if you mix this two, for example, the, the black and red curve, you mix these two uh, proteins together and then put nanoparticles in, they will compete to bind to the surface. So clearly the uh, interaction is something more than a simple additive um, kind of free model type of uh, interaction. So he suggested we could look at this system really thinking from the first principle uh, physics. So, and, and also uh, that will take account of cooperative effect. We do see cooperative effect, for example, in this case, uh, we model it with the exponential decaying curve, but actually there are some fine structures which if you remember in the delta uh, in the p profile the tail was already pretty high so this is a clearly a 
um, cooperative effect. And actually, I measured, I was able to measure the cooperative effect directly using uh, this type of a relaxation experiment. Uh, you kind of see the systematic difference between these two uh, between these two cases, which is basically after the in the absence of a positive charge residue, uh, which is a, a little bit far away, um, we do see the the effect or the influence uh, to the neighboring twenty one arginine twenty one residues. So this minor gap, uh, which is kind of noisy, but it is systematic, is from uh, at least a 32 different individual experiments, each with a finite arrow. So that's why it looks so noisy. But again, this is this is a um, uh, we, we do see the the consistent and systematic difference between these two curves. So Dr. Dawei Li said, let's, instead of summing up all the effects, let's do the, uh, let's build a model that is multiplicative. So basically, instead of uh, adding those uh, effects, he, he, he chose to uh, multiply them together. Uh, I wouldn't really go in detail here for the sake of time, but basically by the end of the day, this new model, we call it a simultaneously linker ligand cooperative binding model, is able to capture the global difference across different IDP molecules. Uh, for example, alpha synuclein is up there, whereas pivoted uh, tad is down there uh, without losing too much of the overall kind of segmental variations. So the quick summary of case two uh, is that the interactions between intrinsically disordered proteins with nanoparticles are strongly sequence dependent. And it is really a combination of electrostatic attractions and the repulsions as well as hydrophobic interactions that cumulatively and cooperatively contribute to this binding. With nanoparticle assisted NMR, we can actually directly study how a IDP molecule interact with the uh, nanoparticle surface in a very uh, accurate in a very quantitative way, uh, also at atomic resolution or at least residual specific resolution. All right, uh, the last stud case study uh, we concerns um, globular protein, so or structured protein. It is just very natural for us to kind of uh, think of a question: What if? we put nanoparticles to a structured protein. So very different from the IDPs, a globular protein can have different motifs. For example, these alpha helices in this IM7 protein, they are very rigid. They doesn't really move too much with respect to each other. However, it also has this flexible loops that are much more floppy. So you know you could look at the secondary structural propensity profile. These regions are very rigid, whereas you have this flexible, floppy um, uh, loops. So we mixed silicon nanoparticles with ion seven, um, and basically do the same thing, marrying the R two, and then take the difference to plot a delta R2 profile. So here are a couple of things that is very interesting. First of all, uh, we got a very smooth profile. In the R2 experiment, you see some of these spikes marked with this asterisk. Um, these are the residues that has some kind of local effect. It, it, for example, they come from the exchange contributions. However, 
these exchange contributions cancels out very nicely in the delta R2 profile. We married, so, so the red shaded area is a uh, one standard deviation from five independently measured profiles. So it is very reproducible. We don't, the, the effect from the uh, exchange cancels out nicely in this profile. And two, if you compare this to the secondary structure, we kind of see a plateau for these helices. However, for these two loops, as well as the C terminus and N terminus, we see a dip, right? We see a lowered delta R2 profile, which remind us of other parameter or S square. So other parameter is a parameter that used to describe the basically the rigidity of a protein molecule. A little more than uh, so so for example, people mirror uh, other parameter from many different experiments. Uh, the most classic is model free analysis from NMR. You mirror R1, R2, NLE, and then do a, a global fitting to extract other parameter as well as the tau C and tau int. You can also get other parameter from other experiments. Here, what different is that we can actually directly read out the other parameter from this delta R2 profile. Um, for the sake of time, I wouldn't go in detail here, but basically under certain um, conditions, which mostly it will be satisfied, uh, the other parameter S square can be approximated by a delta R2 divided by a constant. And this constant depends on the concentration, depending on the bound population, depends on the tau C of the nanoparticle, which is directly uh, associated with the, the diameter of the nanoparticles. So if you, we do a little simulation, what different of these nanoparticle assisted uh, other parameter compared to model free parameter or other free other parameter is that we actually also expand the uh, sensitivity to a much slower motions. For example, from model free analysis, you don't really see the um, internal motions on the you know tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. This is because the molecules itself rotates at this time range. For example, the tau C is five nanoseconds. You couldn't really see any internal motions that is slower than tau C itself. However, with the help of nanoparticles, we kind of effectively expand the tau C of molecules. That allows us to observe, open up a window to observe much slower motions, much slower internal protein motions that goes beyond the, um, the natural tau C of the protein molecule. So if you look at the experiment of IM7, we compare model free uh, parameters, other parameters in the blue trace and our delta R2 other parameters. For loop one, we do see a, a dip or a decrease in other parameter. This is because loop one actually has some uh, slow motions that were not well captured in the model free analysis. Although for loop two, we don't see much additional slower motion. However, these slower motions can be revealed by molecular dynamics simulation. If you run a trajectory long enough, you would be able to observe this type of slow motion. Um, so clearly, 
uh, with a nanoparticle assisted and more spin relaxation, we were able to see slower motions in uh, and to you know study the protein dynamics uh, with kind of a much wider range, covers much wider range of motions. Um, meanwhile, these type of experiment can also serve as a benchmark for us to develop better field, uh, forced field in the MD simulation so that we can get better uh, simulation results. Um, yeah, from MD simulation, we actually see three clusters of the this uh, loop one, um, and and again, this is not a single shot experiment. We tested it on IM seven, which is a globular protein, and we also tested it on CBD. It is a globular protein, but has an elongated shape. However, the nanoparticle interacting with these molecules doesn't really uh, introduce any. Uh, isotropic, isotropic motions is still kind of interacting in a random, non-specific, uh, anisotropic manner. And we will be able to see additional slow motions that is in the loop EF, which is uh, uh, this loop. But for this large loop FG, we don't see any additional slow motion. And very recently, we also applied this nanoparticle-assisted animal relaxation to classic ubiquity molecules. Uh, over the years, there are kind of a debate between whether we have much slower motions in uh, ubiquity. From some of the RDC experiment, it suggested there are. However, from classic model three relax. Uh, analysis, we don't see that. Now with the, with the help of uh, nanoparticles, we can really expand our observation window into the uh, microsecond regime. And you know, we, we try the different size of nanoparticles that really expand the window almost well into millisecond regime. And we don't see additional slow motions for this region. Therefore, this kind of help us to, to say, okay, you know, there are really not much uh, internal motions there. The RDC observed that uh, was very likely because of the kind of the, the fitting arrow, uh, because for RDC uh, experiment, sometimes you have to really prepare those aligned medium uh, very, very carefully and uh, the analysis is very prone to, very sensitive to error. Uh, the error can easily accumulate over time. Uh, so the, this nanoparticle assisted NMR experiment really help us to kind of get a, a better look, or, uh, you know, in a very straightforward way to look at slower motions in ubiquitin. So quick summary of uh, uh, case two or three. Um, nanoparticle assisted and more help us to expand the observation window in time scales on protein dynamics. Uh, and some of these motions are very important for their biological functions. And we can also feed this data back to MD simulation to improve the force fields. Now, let me conclude by showing this slide. We applied nanoparticle assisted NMR spin relaxation experiment to a couple of, to a wide range of different systems, including small molecules, disordered proteins, as well as um, uh, globular proteins. Uh, qualitatively, we can use it to suppress certain spectral lines so that we can get a better uh, identification for metabolites in a mixture. And we can also quantify the binding affinity for small molecules 
by measuring the delta R2 on carbon-13 atoms. And for protein, um, you know, we can kind of uh, look at how different regions of this other protein interact independently and differentially to a nanoparticle surface. And for globular proteins, this allows us to look at different motions, different protein dynamics in the loop region. And if you uh, kind of think of this figure, uh, which shows the different NMR techniques for different, uh, that is sensitive to different time scale, uh, you notice a critical missing, a critical gap here. And actually this nanoparticle assisted NMR helped us to expand the R1, R2 NLE or relaxation measurements well into this nanosecond to microsecond, if not millisecond regime. That is really helpful, uh, provide us a new tool to, lab, to look at protein internal motions in this time scale. Uh, just, you know, uh, there are some very nice reviews uh, in the recent years. Um, you can always read them. And this is my, uh, one of my favorite that textbooks on NMR. And uh, if you want, you definitely uh, should check it out. Check them out. So just uh, uh, before I want to acknowledgement, uh, just very briefly what I'm doing now uh, at U Chicago is that I kind of switched to this um, single molecule NMR sensing regime where we use a nitrogen vacancy uh, color sensor in diamond um, uh, in, in diamond crystal uh, as a sensor to do NMR spectroscopy on single molecules. Um, I wouldn't go too deep on this. Uh, this is kind of showing you kind of like a state of art spectrum of, of NV NMR on carbon-13 labeled ubiquitin molecules. It is very noisy. I uh, I agree with that, but think of a the the ethanol spectrum back in 1951. It was also very very broad. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities. Of course, a lot of challenges in this new field. Uh, but uh, I I kind of uh, really enjoy what I'm uh, researching right now in this and the NMR uh, area. And if anyone is interested in this topic, we can definitely talk more along the way. So the last slide, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Raphael Gushwiler lab where I did my PhD, got really a, a very broad exposure to all type of NMR experiments, not limited to protein dynamics, not limited to uh, metabolomics, but both. Uh, and here, uh, right now, I'm at the University of Chicago working with uh, Professor Peter Marla on this NV kind of a single molecule NMR experiments. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, funding agencies. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, great. That was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, we already have a few questions, so let's start with them. Uh, so the first question is, what are the size limits to the molecules you can study with this technique? I think he refers to case study one with uh, metabolomics. Um, I mean, this is a very good question. Uh, I almost think there is no limit in the sense that nanoparticles are so big compared to the size of a, a molecule, right? Uh, let me maybe move back to this slide. So, you know, as long as a system is kind of in this fast exchange regime, you will be able to 
get a delta R2 value that and the 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 uh, the house drawn the effect R or how large delta R2 is can be controlled by adjusting the concentration of nanoparticles. And then normally you will have a R2B, which is a rotation, uh, the, the R2 rate of the nanoparticles that is very, very large in the 1000, for example, uh, 1600 second inverse second for a 20 nanometer diameter uh, nanoparticles. Um, the, yeah, I just don't really see a limit for molecules uh, that cannot be applicable with this method. Uh, but the only key thing is the system has to be in fast exchange. And, um, you know, if a molecule comes to the surface and bind tightly to the surface, never come off, uh, apparently this method won't work. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, in other sense, uh, for metabolomics applications, that is actually something we want because we want to suppress the spectral eye. You don't really lose anything, right? You do your original measurement of a mixed sample, and then you titrate in a little bit nanoparticles to do the measurement again. So by taking the second spectrum, you actually gain additional information that you won't uh, easily accessible easily otherwise. Mm -hmm. Just my own curiosity, what sort of concentrations are you using and does this affect at all like shimming or data quality of your spectra or it's practically invisible apart from relaxation? Uh, good question. In our case, I think we were working in the uh, 100, kind of in, in the range of 100 um, nanomolar range. Sometimes mm -hmm. in very few occasions, we, uh, for, for like proteins, IDPs, uh, P53, it interacted not as strong. We went up to three micromolar, I believe. Um, but um, yeah, uh, the, the solution, I mean, it is a colloidal suspension, but it looks identical to a solution. We don't have any problem with the shimming. We don't have any problems with the increased viscosity. Mm -hmm. uh, just, a, you know, kind of very robust. That is also why we keep working on with the silicon nanoparticles. It's just uh, very easy to handle. We were kind of lucky in the first experiment, uh, which just got uh, some nanoparticle, silicon nanoparticles, and it worked out very nicely. Uh, later on, we also tried gold nanoparticles. Uh, there are some results there I didn't have a chance to show today, but uh, uh, I think silicon nanoparticles just work very, very neatly, very fine. Nice. So the next question is about the silica particles uh, and if their services are actually treated. Uh, is uh, the surface chemistry sensitive? Uh, I mean, again, this is also a very good question. Uh, over the uh, presentation, I kind of already showed a couple of uh, at the, a couple of places that we use a uh, cationic nanoparticles, in which case the surface was modified by a uh, additional, uh, I believe it's a uh, alumina, aluminum ions to convert the surface to positive charge. But most of the, uh, in most of the studies, I just use the pristine or unmodified silicon surfaces. By the way, we received this silicon, uh, silicon nanoparticles from uh, Axel Nobel which is a company that really manufactures, I think is probably the largest uh, colloidal silica provider uh, in the world. Uh, they use this type of silica not only for uh, like paints or resistance in rubbers, they sometimes, they also have the food um, quality uh, silica nanoparticles that were used to process wines. So they, 
yeah, they're just a very kind of very easily accessible. Uh, we got those samples for free. Uh, they asked us how many you need. Uh, I said one liter. They told me I give you one gallon. So it was a kind of um, a very easy material that we can use. Great. So the next question is, how do you account for multiple other factors that may affect relaxation? Uh, I guess, I guess, yeah, um, this is a, also a very good question. Here, we kind of, I should have emphasized it a little bit better. Um, in, in, in my presentation, we largely rely on to heteronuclear relaxation. Basically, we look at either a, a, a proton carbon spin pair or proton nitrogen spin pair. So we, we do this uh, heteronuclear relaxation measurement. Um, the, so here, the dominant relaxation mechanism is dipolar relaxation and also a little bit uh, CSA, although we kind of uh, already quantified the CSA in most cases. And there, for example, we, we study all these uh, systems at the 850 megahertz magnetic field, uh, uh, about the 19 Tesla. Um, the CSA component is only probably less than 2%. So in this case, it is really dominated by dipolar in, uh, relaxation. Um, that is actually also a reason why we didn't study the system on protons because you know for proton relaxation it can be it has this additional NOE effect which is a, a, a cross correlation term that can complicate the data analysis um, not saying you cannot do it for example professor venditti at the iowa state i think they they showed some really nice best data on, on uh, certain uh, applications recently. Um, they studied proton NMR. In our case, we just want to make our life easier. So we, we kind of keep working on um, nitrogen and, and carbon spins. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. But I guess basically uh, in our case, uh, we don't have any problem. If you want to study other systems, other spin systems, you might have to uh, take a closer look at the, the theories behind it, making sure uh, you know all the other components are taken care of. Okay, so the next question, uh, it's asking about if you are able to recover the cube protein after mixing it with the silicon nanoparticle? Um, that's a very interesting question. And I would say it is possible. I never tried to do so uh, because, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not a really sample limited. I was not sample limited on uh, all of these studies. Uh, however, the you know the, the theory behind it because of the you know fat exchange because of everything, um, indeed, you um, the the system is really reversible. Uh, you can in principle recover the protein with a filter that is with the right molecular weight cutoff. Um, we we did test a a uh, experiment on small molecules. So in small molecules, I didn't show it here, but we uh, we studied uh, a system that is basically the the goal was to remove protein components from human serum so that we can study the small molecules which are metabolites. Uh, with NMR. So the idea was, you know, we have a human serum, 
we need to process the, the, the sample to remove proteins. And in that case, we add a little bit of silica nanoparticles. And because proteins bind to nanoparticles so strongly compared to um, uh, small molecules, um, the proteins are all precipitated out together with the nanoparticles, whereas small molecules remain in the box solution. So I think in terms of that the, the, the reaction, the interaction is really reversible. Uh, if you really need to recover the sample, I don't see a reason why we cannot. It may be just a little bit of ultra filtration um, type of. Nice. The next question is coming from Matthias Back. First, he says it's a great work, and he has a question about the ubiquitin result. Mm -hmm. That he says that it would seem controversial because absence of evidence motion is not evidence of for absence. And would you need to go even higher in a nanoparticle size? And what is the limit of the microsecond time scale? Yeah. Uh, I mean. So, so first of all, I apologize that I didn't really, I, I kind of uh, flew through those two slides uh, for, for the sake of time. Uh, it was a, a latest result we just got. And in, in that study, we actually used not only the 20 nanometer, uh, that, uh, 20 nanometer nanoparticles that we used all the time, but we also used 45 nanometer um, nanoparticles. So if you think that the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, Stokes-Einstein divide relationship, uh, if you double the size, it goes cubic. So we are uh, almost eight fold more sensitive to, or, or we are sensitive to, the like we, we expand the time scale by eightfold. Uh, I think that already made us to sen to be sensitive to hundreds of microsecond internal motions. Um, and even with that, we don't really see any change in 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 this region. So I think at least. Uh, for all the nanoparticle assisted relaxed addiction data. We also measured uh, the, the experiment under both 850 megahertz and 600 megahertz. All the data are very consistent, uh, very re reproducible. I think we, are, we, we just don't observe additional uh, internal motions in, in ubiquity. Okay, so now the next question is coming for, from Supriya. It's, uh, she's asking, what is the exchange rate of the nanoparticle binding with protein? It is also protein dependent. If so, how reliable is the detection of slower microsecond internal motions when the off rate is much faster than the internal motion of the protein? Yeah, I mean, this is a, absolutely a very, very great question. Uh, Unfortunately, we haven't got a chance to really look at this fine details. Uh, we have some preliminary results, for example, in, in this case, again, in the ubiquity study, we noticed a little bit, let's say, differential effects when we use positive charged silica nanoparticles versus negative charged silica nanoparticles. Uh, we observe that in the tail because the tail itself is charged it favors binding of one type of nanoparticles over the other so we do see a little bit differential effect here but for the bulk region including the loop it seems that the this type of uh, non-specific binding or, or this type of uh, specific binding doesn't really bother us too much i really wish we could do more a uh, careful study on different systems uh, and get a, at a get a better sense of this. Uh, as for now, I don't think that is some limitation. Um, it, it, it 
could happen, uh, but I think it is negligible. And uh, in terms of the, the off rate, uh, again, we're up to now, we only look at the fast exchange systems. Basically, by saying that, I mean, uh, we study weak interactions. Um, in most of the cases, we have to use the, so in most of the cases, the proteins and the nanoparticles have to be the same charge. So they primarily repel each other, but sometimes occasionally they can interact. Uh, if you use the opposite charge, most likely the sample will all crush out because of the very strong attractive force. Um, so I guess at some point you just have to choose the system smart, smartly. Uh, a good thing is nanoparticles are, are so diverse, you can probably always find the right nanoparticles to make sure um, the system is working. Great, so the next talk is coming from Alberto. He's saying first an amazing talk and he's asking how varying the size of nanoparticles, how can you be sure that the kinetic of the binding is preserved? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it was a very nice question. I, I guess uh, uh, actually many of the your study uh, on the, on the uh, you know, the liposomes could actually help me to answer these questions. Uh, up to now, we don't, again, we, we haven't really take a very careful look at those systems, but I think those fine details, we can definitely learn from for example, test experiment, and you know, with the liposome system, you can change the different sizes of the nanoparticles, and uh, I think that definitely uh, will actually help me to understand this system better. I don't know whether you will take <laughs> my answer in this way. So let's keep going. We have three more questions. So mm -hmm. uh, the other one is coming again from Subria. Uh, is asking what is the difference of this technique um, in comparison to addition of glycerol in order to increase viscosity and slow down tau C, the, considering that both can disrupt internal motion through specific interaction? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a Again, a very good question. Actually, uh, I think the reason why people kind of stop using uh, glycerol to increase viscosity at some point was because of a, a paper published probably 10 years ago by Professor Skrinikov uh, saying that uh, glycerol will not only slow down the tau C, but also tau int. So if this if the system, if glycerol could already, you know, change the dynamics, internal dy dynamics, then, um, you know, you, you kind of not uh, studying the proteins in their native state. Uh, with the nanoparticles, I think the difference is you can have uh, bulky nanoparticles and you can have proteins that certain loops are floppy and flexible, but all the rest uh, regions are kind of rigid enough. And it just, uh, you know, kind of touches the surface, pick up this R2 enhancement, uh, like every now and then. That doesn't really, um, that doesn't really freeze or impact the internal motion. That at least what we observed for three protein systems, IM7, uh, CBD1, CBD1 and, and ubiquitin. In all these three cases, we didn't really see much uh, impact, uh, especially if you think of the, the cancellation of the uh, exchange. Um, yeah, the, after the, taking the difference, the uh, the, the delta R2 profile looks very smooth. 
um, I, I, I really see the advantage of the nanoparticle assisted NMR over the application of uh, glycerol. I don't know whether that answers the question. Let's hope so. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a time maybe for two quick questions. So these mm -hmm. two that are there. So yep. do you have any aggregation in your protein after increasing the concentration? And if you have any scattering data to support your observation of absorption? Uh, good question. Uh, technical details um, for, I, I remembered most of the cases, we don't have any problems uh, for CYTO2, which is an IDP. Uh, if I can probably go back. For CYTO2, this protein itself is not very stable. I remembered when I add nanoparticles in, uh, everything crushed out at the beginning and then I had to fine tune the pH a little bit and then you know just add nanoparticles very slowly but even then the sample was not stable after a couple hours. For all the rest of the systems um, it was just a very very stable. We I kept the tracking the HSQC spectrum for certain proteins over weeks sometimes months um, yeah, it was just a stable over time. So I guess uh, my answer is it is highly case dependent. Some proteins are just, you know, very unstable. In that case, it, you know, almost impossible to, um, to, to form a very, very homogeneous uh, system with nanoparticles. But uh, other, in other cases, actually in most of the cases, we don't have any problems. Thank you. And the last question is, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't the protein secondary or tertiary structure also change upon absorbing onto the nanoparticles, which will affect also the T2 of the different residuals? I mean, uh, of course, there's a, uh, is a, uh, there is a concern. Uh, and to be completely honest, that was something I would like to observe at the very stage, early stage of my PhD research. As hoping to see kind of a protein denaturation on nanoparticle surface. I, was, I, I thought that would be something cool to look at. But unfortunately, we didn't observe any uh, on, on silica nanoparticles. I know there are some studies reported in the literature uh, that said so. Uh, it just in, in my case, I never observed that. Or, you know, I, I probably introduced more than 20 systems, including all the muta mutations. Um, I don't see any of uh, this kind of a structural change.